guys, I want to welcome you to the weekly Wednesday for the Financial Freedom Newsletter, where every week, every Wednesday, we delve into something inspirational, motivational, something excerpt taken from the Financial Freedom Weekly Newsletter. Wherever you are, if you're listening on Spotify, on iTunes, Google, be sure to click the like, subscribe, share, comment. Without ado, let's get into the show. Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode for the Financial Freedom Podcast, and I'm your host, Dr. Christopher Liu. Today, I have a very special guest, Tom Sharp. He's going to talk to us all about effective leadership for entrepreneurs. He's going to tell us surprising tips, deep expertise, authentic stories. He's a man of great experience and wisdom. And I'm excited for this conversation. So, Tom, welcome. Thank you so much, Chris. Yeah. Um, tell the audience about uh, your origin story, how you got started, and what you're doing now. Sure. So, I'm a typical quick start entrepreneur, or m- I'd better say like a quick start person. I love to to experience challenges, to always be on the lookout for new things. What other people call challenges, I call opportunities, and I'm pretty extreme in that regard, which made me at one point realize I should not be working for a boss anymore. And uh, that's when I started my first company. And uh, I think I've started eight or nine uh, since then. Uh, Most of them were absolute failures, and some of them went really well. And in the process, I discovered that I had to do, when I really wanted to grow my my businesses, I needed to be able to grow my teams. I don't know about you, but where I come from, nobody ever learns anything about leadership in school, nor in college or university. 96% of everybody who is currently professionally leading a team, that's their job description, like managers, entrepreneurs, directors, 96% of them have never had a proper training in leadership when they started out to lead a team, which in my mind right now, years or decades later, is insane. But at the time, I did the same. I threw myself into the deep end. After a short while, I realized that it wasn't going to work out the way I wanted it to. I thought, like, I have all this work. Let's just distribute that to other people, hire a couple more people and get them to do the work. And then everything will be all right. And it of course it wasn't so i figured out how to swim and that's how my personality works if i figured out something then i love sharing it with other people to make their lives a little bit less uh, stressful than mine yeah i love that um it's funny school does not teach us financial education is nope. and it and it it does not teach us about leadership it teaches us how to work for somebody. One question. It also doesn't teach us about friendships or yeah. developing relationships, uh, like how your body should work or inner healing or no, we don't like all the important stuff we don't learn in school. And later you realize I should have learned this in school, right? That's taxpayer dollars. And yeah. For, um, yeah. So one thing is uh, talking about, um, so, you know, you have a lot my of apologies. Time. My phone just gave uh, had the alarm that we needed to meet and we are already meeting yeah what do you talk you talk about uh binary messages and how yes. to free up so much time what is that so my story is i was sitting in my office it was actually a rainy day which was a pretty good uh backdrop to my emotions at the time because i realized that i was e- uh, answering so many 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 emails and the funny thing was that I was at the time at that time I was running a company where we, we were training people in time and stress management. So email was a pretty big part of what we taught people how to do more efficiently. I can type pretty fast, but I started to realize or or this feeling started to sink in that I didn't want to do it anymore. And so what I did, I'm a nerd. I t- I taught computer programmers for a long time. So at that time I built a small app that would calculate how many emails I got every day from my own team members. And it turned out to be on average 150 emails from my own team members. And that was the point where I I realized I cannot go on like this. If my company keeps growing, I will be the bottleneck. This isn't working well. So I basically sent them an email. There's only 10 team members or so, but I sent them an email 
you know, I really want to help you, but I, you cannot email me anymore. Just no emails. Apart from this one exception, which is where you send me an email that I can answer with yes or no. A binary answer, a yes, no answer. To my surprise, what started to happen is that my team started to become much more professional over a couple of months, a year maybe, because this approach forced them to start thinking proactively and to uh, think about solutions instead of just bringing me the problems. So instead of Tom, we have this problem, what should we do? It became, hey, Tom, we have this problem. I think we have three ways to solve it. My proposal would be to take option two because of X, Y, Z. Is that okay? Question mark. And the is that okay? Question mark at the end turns it into a binary email. Yeah, I love that. Um, what about, you know, for example, um, getting rid of meetings? You know, Elon talks about email. Tell us more how to cut off the waste, the excess, and really focus. So what we did is, I realized after a while that I didn't want to do even those binary emails anymore. So I turned it into meetings because if people come to me, if my team members come to me, we can talk much faster than I can write emails, but I still want them to come with binary questions instead of dropping the problems. So we are very efficient now in our meetings, but I separate out a different kind of meetings. So if you have creative meetings where you're going to work on a creative problem and you're going to troubleshoot or problem solve or come up with new scenarios, I love that kind of stuff. I don't mind being in those meetings. For me, it's mostly um, project management, uh, detail-oriented kind of things that I'd like to skip altogether. So I make those meetings as efficiently as possible. Make sure that you have the least amount of people in the meeting and be very sure about what the meeting is all about, what your expected outcome is, and the format for the meeting. So most of my meetings are with just my team leaders. Every once, uh, once every three weeks or so, I would say. Depends a little bit on my schedule. It might be an hour, uh, maybe a little longer. And the format is, we have this problem, this is my proposal, yes or no. We have this problem, this is my proposal, yes or no. We have this problem, this is my proposal, yes or no. And it frees up so much time for creative problem solving, working together, having fun together, enjoying life, and uh, getting rid of all the details ASAP. Um, I love that. And um, it's it's really talking about efficiency and time savings. So, you know, we talk about this. And then the second thing you talk about is what are the six words and what makes them so powerful? One of the things I see a lot with entrepreneurs and with doctors as well, by the way, <laughs> is that we are not entirely sure about where we add the most value to the team or to the company. One of the best ways for people, for entrepreneurs to start delegating more is to figure out what is my high value work, I call it my gold work, and what's my low value work, my nickel work. And nickel work is always the kind of work that you can easily delegate to somebody else, but that you're still doing yourself because you don't believe that you can delegate it, or that you're doing yourself because you don't believe that it's cheaper to delegate it because now you're spending money, right? But if you can delegate something to somebody who processes your email or, or does your simple project man, management or your planning or other administrative stuff for 25 to $50 an hour, that should free up a lot of your time. One of the blockages here that I find is that the hesitations is that, that we need to convince ourselves that we need to delegate more. And one of the most fun ways that I found to do that is to use these six words and they are, I don't know how that works. And it's tongue in cheek. You kind of can use air quotes when you use it. But I open a spreadsheet, I see that it needs to be updated. And instead of doing that myself, going to the server, downloading it, processing it, getting it into the Excel, I um, call Sarah and I tell Sarah, hey, I am looking at the spreadsheet that needs to be updated. I don't know how that works. Can you please do it for me? And it also works uh, getting your car washed, right? It's 20 minutes to the car wash, 10 minutes of wedding, 10 minutes through the car wash, 20 minutes back. You can do a ton of high value gold or even diamond work in an hour. 
and your team member is happy that he or she can finally drive a great car and um, and spend an hour away from the office um which is which is really interesting um and then you talk about how to focus on the most valuable work gold silver and nickel yeah so the nickel work is the kind of work that's easy to delegate the silver work is probably the most insidious type of work because this is talking to your clients doing sales conversations that might be a hundred 150 hour 100 150 dollar an hour work where you actually see that you're making money by doing these sales calls or by having these conversations and it is really hard for people to delegate that to their team but as soon as you start to realize that once you delegate even your silver work to other people now you finally have time to work and uh, to work on the gold work and you do the calculations all those projects that, that are somewhere in a drawer that you never seem to get to but that could be a huge change in your life and your future and the future of your team and your company finally you you find some work to work on uh, some time to work on that, that then it starts to become really easy so then um the other thing is um uh... How do you help entrepreneurs find out what they would really like to do with all their extra free time? And you describe this 97 list. Yeah, so our, in our experience, we work with a lot of entrepreneurs. It's worldwide, especially in the States, I guess. People have this feeling or this experience that hard work is really good for you. It's, it's, it's that attitude, right? If you can cram in two more hours of work every week, you're doing really great. And I feel that the problem there is that it doesn't take into account that most of the gold work, the work that you're where you add the most value, actually needs you to be pretty sharp and rested and creative. And you need to have the energy up uh, here to do that kind of work. When we help entrepreneurs who are so used to run on the treadmill all the time and we get them to back off a little bit, and step by step free up more time in their week, they often find that they don't know what to do with the extra time. So now uh, they're sitting on the couch at night and they feel like, what? Well, I don't know, I'm bored. What should I do? I don't like watching television. I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored. I'll grab my laptop and I'll go work on some stuff that's really interesting, that's fascinating and that, that I enjoy doing. Yeah. So at that point in time, you might realize that you take more time and energy or you spend more time and energy in planning your work than in planning your private life, your personal life. And the 97 list is really great for figuring out what you actually enjoy doing. So what I, the, the 97 list, I ask my clients to write down a list, 97 actual memories, things that happened, things that they enjoyed doing, like once as a teenager I built a, a tree house in the garden of our neighbors and that's one of the items on my 97 list and that one specific day when I was skiing down the black slopes with two of my children that's another item on the list so it's not grouped the idea is you start with 97 that's hard enough for most people things that really happen and then after writing down these 97 lists that you really enjoy doing, you group them and you try to figure out what do I learn from this? So you might realize, I always used to be outside. I loved being outside and then realize, why am I not doing that? Why am I sitting on this couch instead of being outside and, and, and playing with friends or with children or like, you figure out what you actually like instead of just dreaming up stuff your history tells you this is who you are the other thing is um, what i love how you're just you know you have these um philosophies and i just love asking you about them so the other question is you um the trap of starting your day with urgent work tell us about that so what many people do is they wake up especially entrepreneurs they wake up they grab their phone and the first thing they do is they look at their email. I don't know if most people realize this, but your email is basically a copy of the to-do lists <laughs> of everybody around you. That's why they are emailing you. They want to get something done. So they need your information. That, so they send you an email or a decision or whatever. 
the problem there is that right from this bat, you are already losing your focus. And your gold work and diamond work is probably work that you need to have some level of focus for, some level of creative thinking, a little bit of time to work on one problem and to really solve it for once and for all. So I feel that there is this tendency to start your day with the urgent stuff. You check your email, you see if there's anything urgent, and then you run away fixing the urgent stuff. Well, in my mind, the urgent things, they will get done today. Even if you start working at 3 p.m. on the urgent stuff, they will be ready by 5 or 6 p.m. Because they are urgent. So you feel the motivation. There is a deadline. You will put in the energy. You will figure out shortcuts. You will figure out creative solutions. But that does not work for the important stuff that's not urgent. I'm actually not a real big fan of the um, Eisenhower Quadrant because it's really hard to kind of really decide this is urgent and this is important. But starting your day with stuff that feels really urgent, that's a setup for never spending any time on doing stuff that's important. So well said. Um, Yeah, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Um, Other, uh, there's other, you know, tidbits that um, you have is um, you have, you talk about why can delegating more work to your team feel like such a challenge? Yeah, I actually believe that there are so many challenges here. So one of the things I already touched upon is that most people who become leaders in any shape, way or form started out as hard workers. Because if you're a hard worker, you have success, you get things done, you realize uh, successes for the team, and now you get promoted to a level where you become the manager. Or now you get so good at what you do that you start your own business. So the leaders are often the people that have worked really, really hard to, to get to the place where they now are leading a team. The problem there is that every time th- something happens or something goes wrong, what do you do? Well, easy, you fall back in your own old patterns and you start working harder. So you solve all the problems by working harder. Mm -hmm. Combine that with the idea that you know how to do everything. You're probably quicker than your team members. You can do it right the first time. And you feel, some people feel kind of guilty when they offload work that they don't like doing themselves to team members, to other people. So basically what you feel is I made this person's life a little bit harder now and, and less fun. Combine all those emotions and it's pretty hard to start delegating. Mm -hmm. So what I find is what really helps is to make sure that you create a dream team or a dream org chart where you figure out in two years time, if my business keeps doing as now or keeps growing as now, these are the roles that I have in my team. And now you create the descriptions for those job titles. And you start finding people that really enjoy doing those jobs. So I don't know about you, but I definitely fell into the trap where I was hiring people that I uh, clicked with, that I enjoyed being with. The people that resembled me. Well, if they resemble me, they have the same pitfalls. So it took me, I don't know, a decade, maybe longer to learn or to figure out that if I need somebody to do the administration or the bookkeeping day by day by day by day by day, I better find somebody who enjoys that high follow through work. And if he or she enjoys high follow through work, then it's not a problem for me to delegate that type of work to her, because that's her personality. That's what she enjoys doing. And so we are both better off. I get rid of this work that I thoroughly loathe, And that takes me a ton of energy and she has a job doing stuff that she enjoys doing. The other, uh, the other question I have is, um, where you say, um, how to get more done and become a exceptional time-saving entrepreneur. Oh man, there are so many things that you could do. I think that, um, saving time is especially important when you are thinking about what kind of work do you want to spend the time on? So if you save time and you go down from 80 hours to 60 hours or 60 hours to 40 hours or 40 hours to 30, 20, 10 hours per week, what do you want to use the time for? 
are you going to get rid of this nickel work that you really uh that that takes all your time and all your energy and are you going to invest it in gold work or are you freeing up time so you can spend time with your family and if you want to do that i would argue that setting hard boundaries is the best way to do it so for me i don't know about you but i was always working way too many hours and because i felt that i was efficient but if you're working more and more and more hours you're probably not as efficient as you think you're probably just getting more done because you were working more hours and i felt that it made a ton of sense for me to start reducing my work hours by setting up these fixed boundaries so i started with i cannot do any more work af after 7 p.m and when i managed to tackle that i realized that i had started working earlier in the morning so if i wake up at 5 and i start working at 6 a.m it kind of defeats the purpose of freeing up your evening, right? So I started to implement another boundary there. I can just start working from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then I realized that I needed some weekend as well. So I at first tried to keep my entire Sunday free from work, and that didn't work so well for me personally. I felt that at the time I started doing that from Friday evening to Saturday night, no work no books no reading about work no magazine articles no brainstorming nothing if my subconscious mind comes up with a great business id i'm allowed to write it down i'll probably write it down in my phone and then i let it go and go do something else that was a, a game changer for me because when you start your weekend with being relaxed and quiet and not thinking about work all the time then your sunday becomes much more pleasant as well even if you're doing some reading on sunday and i took that to my vacations as well i started to uh, book in more and more and more weeks of vacation every year uh, to the point where if i'm doing my yearly planning I or my assistant, we start with blocking out 26 weeks for vacation. And then during the year, I can, I'll probably exchange some of these vacation weeks and turn them into content weeks where I'm creating more content. And if I start with thinking, oh, I'll just go work this year and somewhere along the way, I'll find two or three weeks to have some vacation. It will never happen. Actually, I love this conversation. How can people contact you, follow you, and reach out to you? Well, uh, Chris, I'm sharing most of my tips on uh, tomsharp.blog, B-L. And uh, I work with a couple of entrepreneurs on a pretty intense basis where we help them to implement all this stuff. So uh, on my website, they can, can find me. They can also find my Twitter. And uh, always love to hear from people or to connect it with them. Yeah. And for all the listeners out there, let's thank Tom for coming onto the show. Um, just priceless wisdom. Enjoyed thanks. all these. And uh, thanks so much for coming onto the podcast. Thank you for having me, Chris. I really enjoyed this. I hope you really enjoyed that wonderful, inspirational, motivational piece. Again, if you, wherever you are listening, if you liked it, be sure to like, comment, share, subscribe. We're on everywhere. Spotify, iTunes, Google, Amazon, Audible. And without much ado, be sure to thank this show's sponsors. And we'll see you next week.